Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I am pleased to introduce Bob Johansson. I had known Bob for now almost seven years or more. And uh, Bob began work in the Institute of the Future in 1973 and has been a professional futurist for almost five decades. Uh, and believe me or not, he is the foremost futurist in the world today. So, you know, with his rich experience and knowledge, uh, I mean, he's phenomenal. Co-author or author of 12 books. He's a frequent keynote speaker and recently completed a trilogy uh, uh, on the details of the types of leadership that will thrive in the next decade, given the disruption of both digital and, uh, and uh, health disruption combined. The intersection of these two is making the world totally different than what it was before. Uh, the new leadership literacy is on the principles of leadership. Leaders make the future. It's skill-oriented vehicles uh, left off. In 2020, he published, I think last time we had the meeting on full spectrum thinking, focused on the future back mindset. I think he will touch upon it today, as well as his latest book, Office Shock, creating better futures for working and living. So what the world is going to be in the next 10 years and beyond, and how it is going to impact our work and living. And believe me or not, every time I talk to Bob, my mind explodes. So without much ado, over to Bob. Now, um, I'm really thankful to all of you to participate today. You will find this interesting and it's going to be recorded and be available later on as well. And let me plug Bob's book, Office Shock. I think all of you should buy a copy or recommend because that's something which is very useful as I found and probably Charles found. So over to you, Bob. Great, uh, wonderful to be with you all this evening and happy to be able to talk about, about Office Shock. Um, just a little bit about the Institute for the Future, where I've I've been for these many years now. Well, we're the longest running futures think tank in the world. Uh, we were a spinoff of RAND in 1968. So we've been doing this a long time. And what I'm going to bring to you today is the view from the future back of this notion of how we work, of when we work, of where we work. And, and even a touch of why, even a touch of why we work. I'm gonna divide my talk into three parts. Um, and then uh, Charles is gonna be uh, asking questions. He'll be monitoring the chat and we'll be having a conversation. And Charles, could you just jump in and introduce yourself and your role? Oh, well, um, uh, most of you, uh, many of you here know me. So I'm a co-founder at uh, Media and Publishing for Founding Fuel. And I've written a book on Aadhaar, co-authored a book uh, on uh, Project Aadhaar and India Stack. Uh, and uh, I'm a professional writer. Um, so I enjoy my work. And uh, thank you for having me over. And, I'll be, and I've been offered the privilege of uh, asking Bob some questions. And Bob, uh, like I was sharing with you earlier, I totally enjoyed uh, reading your book, so much to soak in, and uh, I have some questions for you, and I'm, I'm going to be looking at the chat box. And uh, yeah. and also, also Charles, uh, I was waiting for reintroducing you later on, but you introduced yourself with most of the material I had. Uh, the only thing I want to add is uh, you, you, Charles is also a guest faculty at St. Xavier's and XIC in Mumbai. He teaches feature writing to undergrad and postgraduate students. So, you know, he's a very good soul to uh, lean on in case we want to know how to write something. And uh, he, Charles also was uh, very gracious to be part of the earlier presentation from Bob in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the future is thinking. So we are also providing continuity through Charles. So that is something which is wonderful. Thank you so much, Jay. That's great. So Office Shock is just out. You're one of the first groups that I've talked to about this. It came out just a week ago uh, on sale globally now. And it started during the COVID shutdown. We were approached by a large, very creative furniture maker, USM from Switzerland, um, and asked, how can we start a new conversation 
about the office and about where things are going. Um, and it turns out it's not just about the office, it's also about factories, it's about stores, it's about laboratories, but it really is the question of how do we think about work, um, thinking future back. And the COVID crisis was the shock that created an opportunity. And this was first called the Great Resignation, and then it was called the Great Reset. Uh, we call it the, the Great Opportunity. Uh, so it's an opportunity to rethink the basics. So what I wanna do is do a quick intro for you of those basics. Uh, we'll do three rounds. Uh, the first is uh, around the VUCA world, uh, very uncertain, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. This world of office shock, as we call it, uh, will require future back thinking. So the present is so noisy, and it's a little better than it was the last time I talked to you all about a year ago, but it's in a, in a way the shock is continuing and we think it's gonna continue for about five to 10 years. Um, and this is an opportunity to rethink the basics. Then I'm gonna introduce the framework we introduced in the book, seven spectrums of choice for offices, which is the building, officing, a verb, which is more the process and the office verse, which is how we put it all, how we put it all together. And then finally, we'll end on how do you take away um, clarity of intent with flexibility of execution? You can't be certain in this world, but you can, you can be clear. So let's go into round one, and this will just be about 10 minutes, and then Charles and I will have a dialogue and we'll open to your questions too through the chat. So this is the term VUCA. It comes from the US military, um, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, but it's about much more than military uncertainty. This is actually a wildfire image here. And I am not a military guy by background, but I just happened to have been at the graduate school for the US Army uh, with a group of CEOs the week before 9-11. And I have been brought in there now and have learned a lot from them because they're actually ahead of us in business and in academia at understanding how to thrive in the VUCA world. And I've brought that futures view and have flipped the negative. And by thinking future back, it's clear that vision will counter volatility. So over the next decade, vision will be disproportionately rewarded understanding will counter uncertainty. So it's a time to be listening to each other, uh, not shouting at each other. And that's that's one of the real challenges, and especially in our political environments, they're so polarized, so polarized. Clarity will counter complexity. And, and the military folks call this commander's intent or mission command. And the takeaway is you essentially wanna be very clear where you're going but very flexible how you get there. And we call that in the new book, flexive intent, flexive intent. And finally, agility will counter ambiguity. We all have to be essentially corporate athletes. We have to be physically, mentally, and even spiritually, not necessarily religiously, but spiritually grounded to be able to face this, this VUCA world. So the new book, Office Shock, is about what we call unsettling change. And with the COVID shutdowns, it was abrupt unsettling change in where, when, how, and even why we work. And in the book, we break this down for individuals, for organizations, and for policymakers, for communities. And we're seeing the VUCA world now hitting offices, factories, stores, laboratories, and we think this is gonna continue over the next decade. It's, there's no way to go back to the office the way it was. And in the long run, that's gonna be a good thing. Now is this limited time opportunity for improvement in how we work and indeed how we live, but we all have to create our own story with regard to office shock. It's an internal story and an external story. And it'll be crucial to our future prospects, both for, our, for us as companies, for education institutions, uh, and, and for ourselves as people. So here are the basic definitions. The offices are the buildings, that's the noun, and it's a place. 
Officing is a verb, uh, the ways we work, it's a process. And then finally, we're coining a new word, office verse, which is the mix of all the ways we will work together in the future, both places and processes. So it's this, this archipelago of opportunity, but we have to get smart about where and when we work in which places with which people. Um, so we still will have in-person. Uh, that's not gonna go away. In fact, we're gonna value in-person even more in an increasingly digital world, but it won't be the return to either office or virtual. Um, it won't be the simple hybrid arrangements that we have now. It's gonna be a more creative mix. We thought about using the term metaverse, which I actually like, but unfortunately in Silicon Valley, that term has been taken over by commercial interests, one in particular, that want to own, even to try to trademark that term. They won't, that won't succeed, but we just didn't want to get stuck in that language battle. So we coined the term office verse, but you can also think of it as the factory verse or the retail verse or the laboratory verse. So there's several pain points here, and then we're gonna open this to the first round of conversation. Um, one is productivity. Um, it's been remarkable in the COVID shutdowns, remarkable how office workers have been surprisingly productive without offices. <laughs> office workers have been productive without offices. So it's caused us to rethink what's the nature, what's the purpose of the office and how, how can we essentially do it, do it better. Now there still are some rather old fashioned managers who think that uh, the only way they can tell if someone is working by, is by seeing them at their desk. <laughs> but there aren't many of those folks left. And that point of view just won't be sustainable over time. The, another pain point is attracting the best talent flexibly because flexible flexibility is so important now and talent is so scarce and it's so hard to attract the best people. It's also important to build a strong corporate culture through a mix of in-person and virtual. So it used to be that the way you built a culture was in offices. Um, the offices, it turns out, weren't that good for building culture, but we they could be. So the challenge for us, thinking future back, is how, how can we mix in really well-designed in-person experiences with really well-designed virtual? And then finally, you want to increase your resilience because the VUCA world is going to get worse. It's going to get more, more VUCA. So here's the options. And this is the map we have in the book of where work will get done. There's office buildings. They won't go away, but there will be fewer of them. And they'll be designed differently. What we know that in-person meetings are good for is for um, orientation, trust building, renewal, early stage creativity culture building. There still will be networked offices. There will be links to customers and suppliers. There will be home offices. And here, the COVID shutdown was not fair. It worked well and was freeing for people who had a space to work at home, who had good connectivity, who did not have demands from children or from elders for care, um, but it was unfair. And there's better ways to design those work environments to make them more equitable. And the way you put all this together is what we call the office first. So notice it's not either the office or virtual. It's a blend. It's a blend. And the question we keep coming back to is, how could we work better together to deliver on our purpose? And I noticed there was a chat question right away about purpose and about meaning. I wanna come back to that because this is an opportunity to ask those deeper questions of why we're working. And we know that purpose-driven people are happier, healthier, and they live longer. We know that purpose-driven organizations are higher performing. This gives us an opportunity to ask that question more deeply. So future back, as Jay said, is the big difference in how we think at the Institute for the Future. So we start with the future. 
we don't use the word prediction. Nobody can predict the future. But what we do is an external story from the future with signals to bring it to life. So we're really telling a story that's internally consistent, that's plausible, and that's provocative to provoke your insight, your stories that spark your new patterns of connections in your brain. And ultimately, what you want out of future back thinking is a new approach to your decisions in the present, a new sense of clarity of intent, but flexibility of execution. So it, you know, we're the longest running futures think tank. And the first question you should always ask a futurist is, have you outlived your forecasts? Uh, we have five times over. The second question you should ask is, how have you done? Well, it turns out most of our forecasts have come true. Uh, 60 to 80 percent of our forecasted futures have actually happened. But again, we don't use the word predict. Um, and what we say is that that's not how you evaluate a futurist. That's how you evaluate a fortune teller. The way you evaluate a futurist is, does our forecast, and again, we're usually right, but does our forecast provoke your insight that leads to a better decision in the present? And some of our forecasts around climate, I hope do not happen. <laughs> we'll be successful if we avoid those forecasts. So here's what futurists call the cone of uncertainty. And that's why you think future back, future next now. And most people use, I shouldn't say most people, many corporations use the horizon model, horizon one being the now, horizon two being the next, horizon three being the future. We like the model, but that works better in stable times. In VUCA world times, you want to reverse the order, horizon three, then horizon two, then horizon one. And we go 10 years ahead and 50 years back because almost nothing happens. Almost nothing happens that's truly new. Almost everything that happens was tried and failed years before. So here's the breakdown on, now, on mindset for navigating. You can think tactically, uh, which is say it's an operational challenge and you assign strong operational people to do it. This is what most companies are doing now. It's okay, but it's not strategic. What you need to do is explore and prototype. It's way too early to commit to one approach. And the ideal is to think strategically, uh, to get the C-suite involved, even the board involved, uh, to create your story for how you're going to flip office shock into an opportunity to reimagine how, where, when, and, and even why people work. So that's just where I'm gonna stop and pause for the first time, Charles. Um, and we'll have a conversation about just the setting around the VUCA world and around future back. And then I want to specifically get into office shock and these seven spectrums of choice that we've created. Right. Charles? Yes. Uh, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot you have offered here, Bob. Uh, I, I was just making some notes as you were speaking, you know, that, that got my attention right away. The point you made about vision will be disproportionately rewarded. The, the conversations are getting so polarized. Clarity will trump complexity, flexive intent. Uh, we, we ought to be spiritually grounded and that we're living through unsettling change. All of us that ought to have an internal story and an external story, very important points. But even as you were saying this one, one the, 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 there's something very interesting that you you had you bought you you surfaced in your book uh is that um you know we are so externally focused and uh, a piece of advice you offer in the book is that uh, the next time you meet someone instead of asking what do you do for a living ask them what do you enjoy doing so bob i want to start out you know that all of this is this is there's a lot you offer to think out here Bob, what is it that you enjoy doing? Tell us about it. Why do you enjoy it? <laughs> so I've learned over my career um, that what I enjoy the most professionally is writing. Uh, I'm basically a writer. And for me, writing is a form of therapy. Um, it's even a form of channeling. When I'm doing really well, 
I feel like I'm I'm channeling and I'm I'm able to understand things that I didn't understand until I started writing. So I love writing. I love conversations like this where um, I'm able to share my foresight and hear other people's insights and kind of what they're getting out of it. Um, I love to move. I, I love walking. And I particularly love walking uh, near water. Uh, water is something that I that I love. So those are the things I, I enjoy the most. Um, when I'm able to do those with my family, that's an extra bonus. So since you enjoy writing, does that offer us a segue to speak about GPT, chat GPT that we were speaking about earlier? And what does that mean to the future? Uh, sure. How does that, uh, you, 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 you seem to have taken a liking to that. I, I have. Um, so did you chat, see that coming and what does that mean to us? Um, we, we did see it coming. We've been experimenting with language models for a long time. And of course, the term AI has been around for a very long time. Um, I, I, you know, I'm a writer. And if I'm going to still be writing um, major league books uh, 10 years from now, I'm going to have to be augmented. So I, I think all of us um, have to say, well, how might we be augmented? I want to be augmented. <laughs> and, and to me, um, you know, augmenting is kind of a hedge against aging. Um, and it's a hedge against um, the ability to um, pull things together in powerful ways. So I'm not going to use chat GPT to write my books at the end, I'm going to use chat GPT and its derivatives. I mean, there's other ones we're trying to, you know, BARD and uh, other efforts from other companies. I'm going to use augmented writing to do first drafts. That's the hardest part about writing to me is the first draft. Um, I think I'm going to get a lot of help from language models in the first draft. And in the chapter on the spectrum of augmentation um, in the new book, we... Um, uh, we we actually use GPT three, the the predecessor to Chat GPT. So yes, I think we're all going to be augmented in some way. Thinking future back from ten years ahead, for me as a writer, it's going to enrich in my writing. It's not going to replace me as a writer. It's going to enhance me. That's a that's a great way of looking at it. So, uh, in fact, that's that's another fascinating part which came in. You know, the moment you spoke about, you know that think about it, uh, that instead of thinking about it as augmented intelligence as opposed to artificial intelligence, it made a world of a... Uh, right. Of a, uh, now, right. Since, uh, the, the other thing that you also touched upon while speaking was uh, virtual officing. Um, and that, that you, you just briefly touched upon it while speaking. Uh, and that comes upon uh, comes through in your book. Now, it, it it took me a while to wrap my head around that, and you seem very optimistic about it. You made the point about the office verse, um, as opposed to the metaverse. Uh, now, you know this seems like a very fuzzy idea on the one hand but on the other hand you have had the time to wrap your head around it can you take us through that you know how how do you think it's going to look like what is the world going to look like 10 years from now because you also made the point that you know it's been it's been very inequitable um and um for a lot of people uh, office is the space where you go out to be, to, to, to liberate yourself, you know, uh, from, mm -hmm. from the bounds of the space that you would otherwise find yourself in. Right, right. So if you th think about the office as a place, um, and the office is a place where you have in-person communication, um, we've got a chapter in the, in the book looking 50 years back at the history of offices. Office buildings have been traditionally designed for efficiency, for efficiency. And many offices are very boxy and um, they're, they're not particularly pleasant places to be, uh, many of those traditional offices. Now they could be depending on what your home environment is. So that's where the issue of equitability comes in. Um, for If you think about officing, that's really the ways in which you work, including 
the issue of where, but also focused on how. Um, and then the office versus kind of how you put it all together. So let me just be personal again for this. Uh, you know, I'm a writer uh, and I work in a think tank in Silicon Valley and I travel. So before COVID, I was on the road much of the time, you know, two or three times a, a month I was on a plane. Um, now I work out of my study and I've rethought how I work. Uh, so the metaphor for me is inviting people into my study. So I've, I've got a chair over there and I'm kind of inviting people to come sit with me in my study. I couldn't do that when I was on stage. I've got VR headsets hanging on the wall. And if you want to switch into VR, I'm happy to do that. Um, I've got a story for everything around me. Um, I've got microphones. I've got sound protection. I've got a green screen. Um, I've got everything that allows me to do things virtually in ways that in some ways are better than what I could do when I was on stage and was traveling. And for me, it's a, a lot easier on my body. Now you have to decide um, what your needs are for your career and your interests and then design around that. And the neat thing about Thinking Future Back is we're going to have many new tools for doing this. We're, the medium we're using right now, Zoom, is going to look crude 10 years from now, crude. Uh, so Microsoft Teams, um, you know, WebEx, all of those are going to be, uh, think of them as prototypes for ways of doing it better 10 years from now. And they'll be dramatically better. Zoom was not the first video conferencing. You know, Zoom, video conferencing started in the 1980s. I was there. And many of those systems failed. And they were a lot worse than what we have now. Um, but what we've got now is pretty good. But again, it'll look crude in 10 years. So the ways in which we can put it all together are going to get dramatically better. So it's up to each of us and into each of our organizations, and then to our communities to decide which medium is good for what and how to, how to grow that. So it isn't just the medium, it's how you use the medium. And you know, many people say, oh, I hate Zoom meetings. What they're really saying is I hate badly run Zoom meetings. You know, just like many people say, I hate meetings. Well, that's badly run meetings. <laughs> so we've got to get good, not only at the, the right medium, but in how we use the medium. You want to go to the next section, Bob? Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. Um, so now is where we get into the, the meat of the, no, I shouldn't say the meat, get into the center of the story from the new book, the seven spectrums of choice for offices, for officing, and for the office verse. Now here is more content. We took two years in this project, look future back. And I, I think somebody maybe needs to mute. Um, so we look future back and we identified these seven spectrums of choice. So we're not telling people what to do. We're provoking your choices. And we've thought a lot about this. We've got a, two years of research backing it up. And these are the seven spectrums of choice. They're not either or choices. They're a sliding scale. And we use a music mixing board metaphor that I'll show you in a few minutes. And we recruited young artists around the world through Instagram. We recruited artists to help us visualize these seven spectrums of choice. And we're doing it in order. So many people are saying right now, when do we go back to the office? <laughs> and, and we're saying, okay, that's an interesting question. But for us, that question, when do we go back to the office is number six out of seven. And the first question is, why do you want an office at all? So that is the spectrum of purpose. And the spectrum here is from individual to collective purpose. And this is the first image. Uh, and it's kind of a navigational star image. You know, what is your purpose? And there was research during the COVID shutdown by the Blue Zones project that suggested that purpose-driven people are happier, they're healthier, and they live up to seven years longer. Purpose-driven people who work for purpose-driven organizations are happier, healthier, 
and they live up to 14 years longer. And the companies, the organizations tend to be higher performing. So we know purpose is important. And if we think future back about how we work, we've got an opportunity to build in purpose, to build in meaning in ways we've never done before. And that's what I think you see in that um, kind of flexible uh, mix of talent now, which was called first the great resignation and then quiet quitting. That's basically an expression, a search, a search for purpose, a search for meaning. So once you have that at an individual and an organizational level, then you ask the question of outcomes. And I love this image of the cascading value. Um, how, how can we create um, a spectrum that isn't just profit, but it's also prosperity? It isn't just shareholder value, it's stakeholder value. And where do you fit in that spectrum? And as futurists, thinking future back from 10 years ahead, the most important, the most important outcome will be climate. What are the climate impacts? And here, the spectrum that we introduced is a spectrum from net zero, that's a minimum, to regenerative. That's the goal that we should be pursuing. So you begin with purpose, why an office at all? Then outcomes, what outcomes from the office are you seeking? And then what are the climate impacts in particular of offices? And offices do not have a good track record on this. Many office have been, have offices have been very wasteful about how they consume environmental resources. Then we get to the all important question of belonging. How do you create a culture of belonging in an increasingly virtual world? There are ways of doing that, but don't forget, in-person is best for orientation, trust building, renewal, early stage creativity, and culture building. So how can you blend in in-person experiences, not necessarily in offices, but that's one option. How do you build that into your mix? Then we get to the question of augmentation. And here's where things like um, chat GPT come in. Um, augmentation for us is assuming that on a spectrum from human to technology, assuming that 10 years from now, more and more of us are going to be cyborgs. In other words, more and more of us are going to be augmented. The question is how? How will we be augmented? And you know, as, as a writer, as I said, I know I want to be augmented, <laughs> but how do we want to do it and how can we develop that ability? Then we get to this question of place and time, which has dominated the popular business press. And it's an important question, you know, where and when do we want to work and how through which medium? And the spectrum here is from office buildings to the office verse. Um, I'm going to come back to this, but this image was actually created with Midjourney, which is a very large visual model. And my colleague Joseph Press, who's an architect by training, created this image augmented by Midjourney. And then finally, uh, how do we hold it all together? The spectrum of agility, how do we hold it all together? So the best companies and the best individuals, as they think about the future of work, are thinking about all seven of these spectrums of choice in this order. And this is really important. Not to decide is to decide. So if you're not considering all of these, you still made a decision. You've just made a decision without thinking about it. Most companies we're looking at now are spending most of their time on place and time, and they're not thinking strategically. And that's a very big missed opportunity. So this is the uh, insert, and in, in the book, uh, this is the, I've got the paperback version here. There's an ebook and an audio book. And on the officeshot.org website, there is this handout, this full fold out, and it's in digital form that you can download, even if you don't buy the book. And it's got all of the images I'm showing you on, on the website. So let's pause again, these seven spectrums of choice. and. Maybe while we, uh, while we have our conversation here, Charles, I'm gonna leave this image up for a little while um, and get your questions now, but I wanna keep people 
um, I want to keep in mind the fact that we're talking seven spectrums of choice, and these spectrums of choice are all in order. So in other words, you need to, uh, you need to talk about purpose before outcomes, uh, outcomes before climate, belonging before augmentation, and so on. So Charles, back to you. Yeah, sure. So before I just uh, ask you a question, I just want to remind uh, everyone that if you may have questions, please type them in here. Uh, Jay, is, uh, Jay will be moderating the questions. Uh, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll just pass the mic on to Jay as well. I'll just ask you a question right away, Bob, which occurs to me. Uh, you know, uh, since you're speaking about spectrums of uh, choice, uh, a point that you make is uh, the one on experiential value versus exchange value. Uh, now, we understand it implicitly uh, that came through in the book. Uh, but I have a feeling that, you know, we need to be told about that uh, explicitly. Uh, can you take us through your thinking here? And what are the conflicts that go through people's minds when trying to deal with this? And what does your research show? Right. Um, so what, what the COVID shutdown did was give us an opportunity to pause and ask basic questions. And you re recall the first term that was used was the great resignation, because there, was, there were examples of people resigning their jobs because they realized the job wasn't for them. But most of those people went back to work, but at another place. So it wasn't really the great resignation as much as it was the great resort or the great reset uh, to figure out something that was better. And most of that was recalculating not only the exchange value, um, you know, how much you were getting paid, but also the experience value. Um, value. And the experience value is what's the experience of working with that organization. And in particularly, if you couldn't go to the office, the experience may be very different and very, very limited. So again, we were forced into this abruptly, um, and it was very hard to adapt. So there were lots of pressures. But what we view this as is the great opportunity to rethink not only how much you're getting paid, the exchange value, but also the experiential value and to reimagine how that experiential value might be. And I'm sure it will include in-person experiences, but it may not include, and it probably won't include, going back to the office the way it was. Um, I did a, a conversation just last week with the CEO of a very large traditional company in the Midwest of the US. Um, and I told him about how offices and in-person meetings were best for orientation, trust building, renewal. Um, and he he was in his office and he kind of looked around and he said, Bob, our office isn't very good for any of those things. And, and we don't even have a place to eat together now because there's not enough people to have the cafeteria open. <laughs> so, so what we um, have is a situation and he said his his nightmare scenario is people commute for an hour or two to get to their office and then they go in the office and they close the door and they do a Zoom meeting. Um, you know, that's not the value of in-person meetings. That's kind of the old fashioned office uh, mixed in a very crude way with the office verse. Right, Bob, I'm just gonna uh, pass this on to Jay because I can see some interesting questions have come in. Uh, Jay, uh, you wanna? Yeah, uh, I will pick it up, Charles. I'll pick it up. Uh, uh, Bob, uh, there are two uh, very good questions. The first one is from Shivali. Uh, I would love to hear your views on the future of work and addressing lack of purpose and connection, meaning many feel in their day-to-day -day jobs. Many of my colleagues have taken life-changing decisions to claim back meaning in their lives either resigning or changing careers, and many that did not still admit to dreaming of taking a sabbatical to find their purpose. How can, uh, so the question is, how can work evolve to nurture passion and meaning in the future? That's the first question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's a, a, a great opportunity. This is a great opportunity to do just what you, you've said, 
And for those who can afford it, and again, this isn't fair, it isn't equitable, but for those who can afford it, it's an opportunity to ask basic questions about why, why you're working, you know, what it, what are the impacts you're seeking for yourself and for your family uh, and for society. It's a great opportunity to rethink those basics. And to me, that's the most exciting, the most positive thing about Office Shock is it's a chance to, to do it better. And, and we consciously uh, planned our subtitle. You know, the subtitle is called Creating Better Futures, Creating Better Futures for Working and Living. So we're starting with working, but we're including living. And in part three, we include kind of a checklist for individuals to go through and questions to ask yourself. So uh, I think what you've outlined is something that is happening at scale. Um, but again, it's not fair. Uh, it's, it's easier to do if you can afford to do it, uh, or it's possible to do if you can afford to do it. If you can't, you get locked into some very narrow things. But again, we've got an opportunity as organizations, we've got an opportunity as societies to, to do it better and to do it in a more equitable way. We've got a project going on at the Institute for the Future now led by uh, Marina Gorbis that is on the equitable enterprise, asking how we can design enterprises that are more fair, more equitable, uh, not just preparing people for jobs, but reimagining how organizations might uh, be more on that spectrum toward um, stakeholder value, not just shareholder value. And in our chapter, we talk a lot about those. Thanks, thanks, Bob. I hope, uh, Shivali, uh, you had your question answered. Next one is from Rinka Singh. Uh, Rinka comes from a, a perspective which is old fashion managers who don't want to change. <laughs> and uh, she take a systems perspective, looking back at the history of organizations, especially the management of organizations, uh, you know, various studies, perspectives from Fred Taylor, the Hawthorne experiment, et cetera. One of the underlying assumptions that most theories make the physical presence of the office very essential. This has resulted in the current systems that managers are used to which they are comfortable with and can trust. This is the reason why they don't want to change. So the question is, as we look to the future, the breaking up of office facilitated by fast networks and asynchronous working will have major impact. How can we look at interactions, office systems to look at what impact are possible and have answers for them? Any thoughts? Yeah, this is a, this is a tricky one. <laughs> And I'm, I'm sure that uh, there will be tension here between more senior managers who are used to more traditional office buildings and are making you know, rather simplistic calls back to the office. Uh, just this last week in the Congress of the United States, there was a new bill introduced to try to call government workers back to the office. Um, and it was an unfortunately written, written uh, bill that basically assumed that office workers were lazy, uh, government office workers were lazy, and, and, and the politicians needed to force them back to the office to make sure they were working. Um, it's, it's kind of a crude um, but understandable logic that happens in polarized times. Um, and in the U.S. government, we've got uh, civil servants that are not uh, they're they're not beholding to either political party um, that, as best I can tell, do quite a good job. Um, but the trust issue in government is such an issue. So to me, this all boils down to trust. Um, and we've got to figure out a way that you can measure performance. Um, and uh, build trust and grow grow trust. And we know from the neuroscience of trust now that um, you know, trust is processed in one portion of our brain that's that's more rational um, and 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 mistrust is processed by another portion of our brain that's more emotional. <laughs> and 
And social media, particularly in polarized times, social media are really good at spreading mistrust or distrust. Uh, they're not very good at building trust. So in this kind of mood of mistrust, you know, the uh, Edelman Trust Survey just came out, uh, the trust index that's done every year, mistrust is now the default emotion. And in a, in a world where mistrust is the default emotion, you can see why some traditional managers say, well, I only know if people are working if I see them at their desk. Now, that's not true. Uh, and to some extent, those, uh, those managers will, will, will just have to get over it. Uh, and we may have to outlive them to see how to reimagine this, this space. But in another sense, we've got to figure out a way to, to grow a sense of trust, to grow a sense of how do, you, how do you evaluate people and make sure they're performing, but also create a climate of trust and a climate of meaning and, and purpose. Um, so it, it's going to be very dicey and difficult. And that's why I say office shock. It's not just going back to the office. We can't do that alone. Um, it's, and it's going to take five to 10 years for itself to play out. But this is a, this is a big issue. Um, but I'm afraid some of it is just uh, those, some of those senior managers are, are going to need to retire. <laughs> and, and they're going to need to be out of the picture for the new world to, to happen on a fully scaled way. So before you, before you move to the next section, Bob, uh, uh, a question here. Uh, you just made the point that mistrust is the dominant emotion. Uh, you it's also made default. the point. Yeah. Uh, you also made the point that you know we are at that inflection point uh, where the demographics are going to go through a fundamental shift, and uh, young people are going to be in. Uh, there are going to be a lot number of young people. So in the interim, uh, from the now to the future. Um, what do you expect in the interim as a futurist, this transition, how painful or how do we prepare ourselves for this change? Yeah, it, it's going to be very jagged, very, very jagged. In other words, some parts will be really good and hopeful and some parts will be really bad and disturbing. Um, I, let me say about kids, we talk a lot in the book about young people. We define true digital natives as 26 or rather 27 years old in 2023 or younger, we define the, the uh, cross reality or the XR natives as 17 or less in 2023. Uh, so even the XR natives are almost in the workforce. I'm really optimistic about these young people if, if they have hope if they have hope. If they don't, there's the risk of depression and even suicide and this kind of lack of hope. That links back to trust. So we, we need to build that climate of trust, that climate of cooperation, that climate of being able to work together. And it does require trust and it does require hope. But that mix of young people, as they come into the workforce and as the more out of touch senior managers who can't make the transition as they leave the workforce, then it gets a lot more hopeful to me. Uh, so that's why I think, again, it's going to take five to 10 years for this office shock transition to stabilize. And I believe there's an opportunity for it to stabilize with this sense of hope. And I believe that many of these young people entering the workforce will have a competitive advantage over people who are older than them and they're gonna be leapfrogging. Uh, we see this in the military too. In the military, it's not command and control anymore, but it is hierarchical and there is kind of a linear path, but the XR natives who grew up with gaming and grew up with ability to learn in ways that senior people can't learn, they're leapfrogging people uh, in ways that you wouldn't expect. Um, so that's what makes me optimistic is this mix of the younger people entering the workforce is really encouraging to me if, if those young people have hope. Can we move to the next round because we have 10 minutes left and yeah, cool. we should be able to round off. Yeah, th thanks, thanks Jay. Okay, so I'm, we'll do a quick finish here. So um, 
what we want out of this and what I want to leave as a takeaway is you want clarity of intent, be very clear where you're going, but flexibility of execution. And there's a couple of different forecasts. Those of you who read my earlier books, I want to remind you of a couple of basic forecasts. One of them is the future will reward clarity, but punish, punish certainty. So certainty is brittle and brittle breaks. Secondly, anything that can be distributed will be distributed. And I mean distributed, not just decentralized. And the, the author, Michelle Dean, says this best. She says, authority has become something diffuse and flammable, like spray paint, like spray paint. <laughs> so we can't just tell people what to do in this world. This is going to be a distributed world. So you want to be very clear about direction, very flexible about execution. So we don't have time to go into all of these in depth, but I do want to do a few of them. And I'll share a PDF of all these PowerPoints uh, with your group. Um, so this is going back to the spectrum of purpose. Imagine a world where more office workers are motivated by a sense of meaning and purpose. And the question here is, how can your company, your organization, provide more purpose for their workers and the communities they serve? And the spectrum spectrum is from collective to individual. So what you'll need to do to develop your clarity is work your way through each of these spectrums of choice. And we suggest these images that we got from young people around the world, uh, not as necessarily the right image, but just an image. And we invite you to create your own image, create your own sense of purpose. How, what does good company mean to you? Then pursuing prosperity, the spectrum of outcomes, this image, imagine a world in which offices generate both financial return and social value. How can your company increase both shareholder value and shareholder benefits, stakeholder benefits? And here's the spectrum there. So I'm going to ask that each of you think this through for yourselves and for organizations. So here's climate. Again, the scale is net zero to regenerative. And community, um, how can you create, how can you design for difference? Because 10 years future back, we will have an increasingly diverse world and increasingly diverse workforce. How do you design for that diversity and create a climate of inclusion, a climate of belonging? Um, now, here's the spectrum. This is the one I want to talk about some more. Imagine a world in which offices and officing will be augmented, extended, and enhanced. And again, my opinion as a futurist is that essentially uh, everybody on this call is going to be a cyborg 10 years from now. <laughs> We're all going to be augmented. There really isn't much of an option there. The only question is, how augmented do you want to be? Um, and how can we augment workers in such a way that optimize both human and machine potential? Where do we want to be on this spectrum of human technology? I'll tell you where I want to be, right in the middle. I want to be right in the middle. I want to be fully human and fully augmented. <laughs> you know, I, I want the both and. But uh, chat GPT is really interesting. So this is um, the first article that appeared in the BBC uh, seven days after the announcement and release. Um, and the image is just so amazing here. Um, the new chatbot has everybody, everyone talking to it. <laughs> I would have said talking with it, um, but it's really interesting in that regard. And the, the signal here, and again, we believe in signals. The uh, Gib William Gibson said, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. Um, and this is one of those. So on November 30th, OpenAI launched ChatGPT as a prototype in trial use for free. And many of you have tried it, and I know some of you are using it uh, more heavily. ChatGPT is built on OpenAI's GPT-3, which we used to write the augmentation chapter of Office Shock. And uh, the stable release was just a few days ago. Uh, so the so what to me, uh, the so what is excuse me, finally, AI has become practical. 
And it's important to realize the term artificial intelligence was coined in 1956 at the famous Dartmouth conference, 67 years, 67 years to be an overnight success. So this has been a long time coming. And chat GPT invites us to ask what humans can do best and what we wanna to keep to ourselves and what computers can do best. So over the next decade, these questions will be answered with much more precision and wisdom than before. So finally, the better than being there, again, this mid-journey image um, and coordinating with clarity. So I'm gonna stop at this point. I know we're right at the end of our time almost, but I've given you a taste of the book. Um, I put in the slides how you can order it at a deep discount. And I put in the slides in the back a um, set of the skills from my book, Leaders Make the Future, the literacies from the new leadership literacies, um, and the reference to the book, Full Spectrum Thinking, which is about mindset and leads to the notion of, of future back as we've discussed it. So, uh, Bob, Bob uh, uh, one question is, can you go to your next slide? Because I want to show that before I ask the question. Uh, Wait, which... Because, uh, you know, you have a special offer to the team of 30% off. Oh, yeah, sorry. Something. Sorry, let me, uh, let me do I'm not a very good sales guy. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm just saying that. Uh, okay. Um, so here it is. Next one. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I mean, I will, I will ask one more question because that's what we will have the time for. But for everybody, the book is available for a 30% off, uh, you know, print in the US, but ebook and audio book everywhere. Maybe you will have more questions. But one question that I have, Bob, is, uh, you know, we have the book, we have the slides, but going from time and place, which is where the thinking is today, how do you expand it to the seven dimensions or seven spectrum? And how do you dial it up and now? What is the process by which a company or a corporation can go about it in a practical manner to set the vision the way you want it to be? You have expressed it here. So the, the practical way is to use the seven spectrums of choice. So we're doing that with a number of different companies. Um, and I, I think some of you know Walmart, the world's largest company, had decided before uh, before the uh, shut before the COVID shutdown that they were going to create a new campus. Uh, they're still doing it, and we're working with them to take the seven spectrums of choice and apply it with their thought leaders. So it isn't just going back to the office, uh, but it's figuring out how to best use the new the new campus in combination with all the different virtuals. And of course, in the world of Walmart, the store is at the center. So it's the retail and, and then the distribution center and the office and the home office is our third. So the way to do this is to use the seven spectrums of choice. We can coach you in how to do that. Um, we also have an office shop council that gathers together companies that are doing this around the world. Uh, BASF is one of the companies we're working with most closely there. It's They're based in Germany. And of course, with USM, the uh, office furniture design company that supported uh, this research right, right from the start. Thank you, Bob. I think uh, that was terrific. Uh, uh, does anybody else have a burning question uh, to ask? I will look at the chat box if there is none. Uh, you know, uh, I would I would like to close on time at uh, eight o'clock. Am I right, Karthik? Uh, so it's a fantastic one hour of thought provoking work from Bob and Charles. You have read the book so much. I think your questions were really illuminating. So even though we don't have in the end questions, I think the way we broke it up into questions in every section, I think made it much more interesting and valuable. Uh, so Charles, thank you very much. Bob, thank you very much. And Karthik and Venki, Venki, you put this together and Karthik, uh, you set thank it up so much. well. Thank you so much. Lastly, I would like to thank, thank all the participants here. Please carry the message because I think if you can make a, you know, almost like a, uh, in a pond, you throw a bubble and it starts a ripple effect. I think you are the catalyst who can carry the ripple effect of the office uh, uh, office worse, as Bob put it, 
I think you can be the champions for that in the community and in the country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone.